just as a human being, let me ask you about this one particular anecdotal evidence of the Google engineer who made a comment or uh, believed that there's some aspect of a language model, uh, the Lambda language model that exhibited sentience. So you said you believe there might be a responsibility to build systems that are not sentient. And this experience of a particular engineer, I think, I'd love to get your general opinion on this kind of thing, but I think it, it will happen more and more and more, which uh, not when engineers, but when, when people out there that don't have an engineer background start interacting with increasingly intelligent systems, we anthropomorphize them. They they start to have deep, impactful um, interactions with us in a way that we miss them yeah. when they're gone. And we sure as heck feel like they're living entities, self-aware entities, and maybe even we project sentience onto them. So what, what, what's your thought about this particular uh, system? Was is uh, Have you ever met a language model that's sentient? <laughs> no, on record? no, and, no. And what do you make of the case of when you kind of feel that there's some elements of sentience to this system? Yeah, so this is, you know, an interesting question and uh, uh, obviously a very fundamental one. So the first thing to say is I think that uh, none of the systems we have today, I, I would say, even have one iota of uh, semblance of, of consciousness or sentience. That's my personal feeling interacting with them every day. So I think this way premature to be discussing what that engineer talked about. I, pre I think at the moment it's more of a projection of the way our own minds work, which is to see uh, 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 sort of purpose and direction in almost anything that we, you know, our brains are trained to interpret uh, uh, agency basically in things, uh, even in, in inanimate things sometimes. And of course, with a, uh, a language system, because language is so fundamental to intelligence, it's going to be easy for us to anthropomorphize that. Um, I mean, back in the day, even the first, uh, you know, the dumbest sort of template chatbots ever, Eliza and, 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 and the ilk of the original chatbots back in the 60s fooled some people under certain circumstances, right? It pretended to be a psychologist. So it would just basically wrap it back to you, the same question you asked it back to you. Um, and uh, some people believe that. So I don't think we can, this is why I think the Turing test is a little bit flawed as a formal test, because it depends on the sophistication of the of the judge, um, whether or not they, they are uh, qualified to make that dis distinction. So I think we should uh, talk to, you know, the, the top philosophers about this, people like Daniel Dennett and uh, David Chalmers and others who've, who've obviously thought deeply about consciousness. Of course, consciousness itself hasn't been well, uh, there's no agreed definition. If I was to, you know, uh, speculate about that, uh, you know, I kind of, the def the working definition I like is it's the way information feels when, you, you know, it gets processed. I think maybe Max Tegmark came up with that. I like that idea. I don't know if it helps us get towards any more operational thing, but, yeah. but it's, 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 I I think it's a nice way of viewing it. Um, I think we can obviously see from neuroscience certain prerequisites that are required, like self-awareness, I think is necessary, but not com sufficient component. This idea of a self and other and set of, of coherent preferences that, that, that are coherent over time. You know, these things are maybe memory. Um, these things are probably needed for uh, a sentient or conscious being. Um, but but the reason, the, the difficult thing I think for us when we get, and I think this is a really interesting philosophical debate, is when we get closer to AGI, and 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 you know uh, and and much more powerful systems than we have today. Um, how are we going to make this judgment? And one way, which is the Turing test, is sort of a behavioral judgment. Is is the system exhibiting all the behaviors um, that uh, a human sentient uh, or a sentient being would 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 exhibit? Um, is it answering the right questions? Is it saying the right things? Is it indistinguishable from a human? Um, and so on. But I think there's a second thing that makes us as humans regard each other as sentient, right? Why do we why do we think this? And I debated this with Daniel Dennett. And I think there's a second reason that's over often overlooked, which is that we're running on the same substrate, right? So if we're exhibiting the same behavior, uh, more or less, as humans, and we're running on the same, you know, carbon-based biological substrate, the squishy, you know, few pounds of of flesh in our skulls. Then the most parsimonious, I think, explanation is that you're feeling the same thing as I'm feeling, right? But we will never have that second part, the substrate equivalence, with a machine. Yeah. 
yeah. right? So we will have to only judge based on the behavior. And I think the substrate equivalence is a critical part of why we make assumptions that we're conscious. And in fact, even with, with animals, high level animals, why we think they might be, because they're exhibiting some of the behaviors we would expect from a sentient animal. And we know they're made of the same things, biological neurons. So we're gonna have to come up with explanations uh, or models of the gap between substrate differences between machines and humans to, to get anywhere beyond the behavioral. But to me, it's sort of the practical question is very interesting and very important. When you have millions, perhaps billions of people believing that you have a sentient AI, believing what that Google engineer believed, mm. which I just see as an obvious, very near-term future thing, mm. certainly on the path to AGI, how does that change the world? What's the responsibility of the AI system to help those millions of people? Mm -hmm. um, and also what's the ethical thing? Because you can you can uh, make a lot of people happy mm. by creating a meaningful, deep experience with a system that's faking it before it makes it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't, is, are we the right, or who is to say what's the right thing to do? Should uh, AI always be tools? Like sure. why? What? Why are we constraining AI, AI to always be tools as opposed to friends? Yeah, I think. Well, I mean, these are you know, fan, you know, uh, fantastic questions and and also critical ones. And we've been thinking about this uh, since the start of DeepMind and before that because we plan for success. And you know how how in you know however remote that looked like back in 2010. And we've always had sort of these ethical considerations as fundamental at DeepMind. Um, and my, my current thinking on the language models is, and, and large models is they're not ready. We don't understand them well enough yet. Um, and in, you know, in terms of analysis tools and, and guardrails, what they can and can't do and so on to deploy them at scale. Because I think, you know, there are big still ethical questions like should an AI system always announce that it is an AI system to begin with? Probably yes. Um, it, what, what do you do about answering those philosophical questions about the feelings uh, people may have about AI systems, perhaps incorrectly attributed? So I think there's a whole bunch of research that needs to be done first um, to responsibly, before you know you can responsibly deploy these systems at scale. That will be at least be my um, current position. Uh, over time, I'm very confident we'll have those tools, to, like interpretability questions um, and uh, analysis questions, uh, and then with the ethical quandary, you know, I think there it's important to uh, look beyond just science. That's why I think philosophy, social sciences, even theology, other things like that come into it. Where um, what it, you know, arts and humanities. What 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 does it mean to be human and the spirit of being human and and to enhance that and and the human condition, right? And allow us to experience things we could never experience before and improve the the overall human condition and humanity overall. You know, get radical abundance, solve many scientific problems, solve disease. So this is the era I think. This is the amazing era I think we're heading into if we do it right. Um, but we've got to be careful. We've already seen with things like social media how dual use technologies can be misused by firstly by 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 bad you know bad actors or naive actors or crazy actors right so there's that set of just the com common or garden use you know, misuse of existing dual use technology uh, and then of course there, there's an additional uh, uh, thing that has to be overcome with AI that eventually it may have its own agency so it could be uh, 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 good or bad in, in in of itself so I think. These questions have to be approached very carefully um, using the scientific method, I would say, in terms of hypothesis generation, careful control testing, not live A-B testing out in the world. Because with powerful technologies like AI, um, if something goes wrong, it may cause you know, a lot of harm before you can fix it. Um, it's not like a, you know, an imaging app or game app where, yeah. you know, the, if, it, if something goes wrong, it's relatively easy to fix and, and the harm's relatively small. So I think it comes with, you know, the, 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 the usual uh, uh, cliche of like with a lot of um, power comes a lot of responsibility. And I think that's the case here with things like AI, given the, the enormous opportunity in front of us. And I think we need a lot of voices uh, and as many inputs into things like the design of the systems and the values um, they should have and what goals should they be put to. Um, I think as wide a group of voices as possible beyond just the technologists is needed uh, to input into that and to have a say in that, especially when it comes to deployment of these systems, which is when the rubber really hits the road. It really affects the general person in the street rather than fundamental research. And that's why I say 
I think as a first step, it would be better if we have the choice to build these systems as tools to give. And I'm not saying that it should never they should never go beyond tools because, of course, the potential is there um, for it to go way beyond just tools. Uh, but um, I think that would be a good first step uh, in order for us to, you know, allow us to carefully experiment and understand what these things can do.